Hello, and welcome to episode 29 of That Encyclopedia Podcast with your hosts, Jacob and Will. Hello. Today, we are recording an episode based on an article with, I think, the longest title so far. Uh, It concerns the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens, which is the deadliest volcanic eruption to have occurred in the history of the contiguous United States. It took place on, well, it began to take place on the 27th of March 1980, but the main eruption wouldn't occur until almost two months later on the 18th of May. It resulted in billions of dollars of property damage, uh, a completely changed landscape, uh, ash coverage in the skies that would affect most of the country, and of course spilled over into neighbouring Canada and the Pacific Ocean, and unfortunately also claimed the lives of approximately 60 people. This event has uh, caught our attention because, well, <laughs> for me personally, I remember learning about it in school in the, in the UK, and uh, I thought it would be good to go over it in the, in the nitty gritty detail and see if there's anything that I had failed to remember, misremembered, or indeed things that I just was never told and had never learned. Will, what do you think about the eruption of Mount St. Helens? Well, I think that the article, and I think it reminds me of studying it in school as well, and that's in a large part because there's a strong focus on describing the geography and the geology of the eruption. And I I do remember learning about that. I think we sort of learn about it as a case study for, for volcanoes. But there's... A reason in here that there's there's reasons why this is the case study for volcanic eruptions probably a couple of reasons one of them I expect is actually because it's recent in historical terms it's not that long ago May 18th 1980 um, so that combined with its significance and the the impact of it but I think the reason I say because it's fairly recent It means that we simply have more data on it or we have more more relevant data to to understanding the eruption in modern scientific terms Mm -hmm. and interestingly part of that is thanks to some of the people that actually tragically died during the eruption that's right yeah there was um because this volcanic activity had lasted for a couple of months prior to the main explosion, uh, the US um, government agencies and private researchers had sufficient warning and time to, um, uh, to, to set up uh, study teams and, of course, importantly, evacuate uh, individuals uh, around the potential uh, volcanic eruption site around the mountain. Um, this is why I think the death toll is surprisingly low. I mean, when you when you say that the uh, in in the article when you read that the explosion had the force of I think it was something like fifty four megatons of TNT or the equivalent of fifteen Hiroshima bombs, thankfully without the radiation. Um, uh, you you would imagine that the, the 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 loss of life that could result from this would be in the tens of thousands easily but only around 60 people died as i mentioned and i think a large part of that is due to the warning uh, that was communicated to the american public and government uh, thanks to the efforts of these scientists many of whom indeed were still on the slope when it uh, exploded because uh, you have uh, it's a it's it's a general warning but it's not precise enough to evacuate the slope in time if something goes wrong if, a, if an earthquake for example triggers a phreatic blast um, sorry uh, do continue well the the other reason I was going to say is the um, goes back to the significance and actually it's 
it, it doesn't feature the bulk of the article, even though it is probably the reason why it's such a famous eruption. Uh, and I would expect that the large part of the the impact of this eruption was um, for a similar reason as earth as um, volcanic eruptions more recently in history that you may remember is actually volcanic ash. Um, so less so the the actual pyroclastic flows and the lahars, which are the 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 mudslides. Um, and such the less of the direct result of the the force of the volcano and the heat and the magma but whenever a volcano goes off like this a, a big one in a big way you get mm. a lot of ash a lot of ash fall and the ash distribution of the mount saint helens eruption is is pretty is pretty broad i mean you've got ash being found in oklahoma um bear in mind this this uh volcano is in washington state and washington state is the most northwest state in the usa and oklahoma is right there in the uh, in the middle sort of to the south just above texas so Ash spread a long way, and ash is quite bad for a couple of reasons. So, ash can be f uh, f it's, it can be fine grained. It can be gritty. It can destroy combustion engines. It can destroy mechanical electrical equipment. It can cause short circuits in electrical transformers. So it can cause blackouts. It can contaminate oil systems, clog air filters. That's the large economic impact of a volcano going off generally. Um, even though, yeah, I, I, I imagine before you learn about a volcano for the first time in school, you associate it with lava and you think, oh, that's the problem. And something else that ash causes, or that less immediately destructive, is lightning because mm. ash clouds that em um, emanate from the calderas of volcanoes uh, have or generate a lot of static electricity. Um, and so when that kind of snaps, it snaps in the form of a lightning bolt uh, and thunderclap. And the ash clouds uh, that were rolling down Mount St. Helens, and this is prior to its eruption, kind of in March and April, were generating lightning bolts that were up to two miles long through the night sky and I think this is something that's so engaging, studying volcanology, as opposed to other parts of uh, uh, geology. Um, no offense to, to geologists out there, of course, but volcanic activity triggers um, other natural phenomena as well. I think you could argue, actually, that really it's all earthquakes' fault, uh, because it's a actually a series of earthquakes that triggered the early warning systems, and ultimately it was a 5.1, 5.2, um, magnitude earthquake that ultimately triggered the phreatic blast, which is the the main explosion. Um, but well, I would I would argue it's 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 the the essence of a volcano, though, right? Because it's the the magma beneath the earth causing all of this to happen in the first place. Precisely, yeah. Um, a volcano is really a how if you were to use uh, a, the metaphor of a body, uh, will. What would you say a volcano is a like a um, like a like a a high blister? a high pressure zit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like a blister or, or a zit on the on the on the skin on the surface of the world. Um, I, I think we should explain actually what what actually <laughs> happens when a when a when a volcano like explodes. Um, what 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 causes what causes such a mighty eruption, um, and particularly in the case of of Mount St. Helens um, because we have different types of volcanoes uh, which behave in different ways and form through different means um, and are more or less dangerous. Um, uh, in the case of Mount St. Helens, uh, what triggered such an almighty explosion was essentially a combination of two things. You have, as we'll mention, the magma uh, inside the earth and this is 
pushed up uh, through the formation of the volcano and simmers just out of sight underneath uh, the surface of the mountain. And then you have its elemental opposite, you could say, uh, in our chemical terms anyway, as uh, water, specifically snow and ice uh, that rests on top of the mountain. And to a lesser extent, you also have just natural groundwater that's beneath the surface as well, but a little bit higher um, in elevation than the magma is. But particularly in the context of a mountain volcano, it's often this kind of um, groundwater that melts from the snow and the ice. Uh, it finds its way down through uh, the cracks in the earth. Water is very patient and very, very good at getting everywhere with enough time. So there, it will find a way. And if there isn't a way, it will make a way. And this is bad news for the volcano because when cold, near freezing water comes into sudden unexpected contact with uh, magma or lava, it more or less instantaneously evaporates into steam. And it evaporates so quickly that it builds up an enormous amount of pressure. And the mountain is strong. It can, it can withstand a surprising amount of this. And uh, if it's lucky, there may be uh, systems in place and vents uh, just uh, due to how the, the, the volcanology works uh, that allows the steam to kind of vent without uh, becoming too dangerous. Uh, such as out the top of the volcano through the caldera, which is the hole in the rim around the top of your classic mountain-shaped volcano. Um, you know, so it's not going to pop its lid off every time it rains, for example. But if it uh, occurs either sufficiently quickly or in a sufficient amount, or if an earthquake, for example, triggers um, a shift in the uh, geography suddenly, then the steam can reach a critical point and just like a, uh, a, a lid on a pot on the stove uh, overflowing, it will literally just explode. Uh, the pressure is so great that not even a mountain can protect it anymore. And this is your phreatic explosion. And it was particularly dangerous in the case of Mount St. Helen because um, at least initially it was expected or hoped that this would occur around the top of the volcano in a so-called vertical eruption. Uh, this is more normal and it's a lot safer because a vertical eruption, although it does distribute ash evenly everywhere, um, it is also uh, ma maximizes the amount of uh, the mountain itself that takes the, the debris uh, which is to say the pyroclastic flows, the uh, the mud flows, the avalanches that are triggered. Um, it's all sort of contained on the slopes of the mountain itself. Still dangerous if it's uh, sufficiently powerful. Um, but it's sort of the optimal place for the explosion to occur to minimize damage to the rest of uh, the area. But sometimes, as in the case of Mount St. Helens, uh, you don't get what you want. And it triggered an eruption on uh, one of the slopes instead of around the caldera uh, called a lateral eruption that unevenly and to a much greater extent distributed debris, pyroclastic flows, uh, lahars and so forth down one side of the mountain, uh, not so much down the other side. Now that's not to say if you were standing on the opposite side to the explosion site you would be fine because ultimately everywhere within a certain uh, radius is going to be obliterated by an explosion that powerful. But it is definitely true to say that I think the west side of the mountain um, uh, got the, the, the short end of the stick and was uh, particularly, uh, particularly devastated. Um, yeah, would you, any, anything to add to that sort of technical description, Will? Um. I guess just clarifying again the 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 different types of uh, different types of damage damage dealing devices that these uh, volcanoes deal with. So a, a pyro 
Clastic Flow, for example, versus a Laha. Um, the Pyroclastic Flow is this fast moving hot gas so it's not it's not lava but it's like all, all the all the hot gas from down that was that was previously contained and compressed within the volcanoes released and forced out and it can travel it can travel average speeds 100 kilometers per hour but it can reach speeds of 700 so it's we're talking like 30 meters per second on average and around um, a few hundred to a thousand degrees centigrade so they're really the the primary ah oh, here's the word here's the word for it volcanic hazards <laughs> so <laughs> they're the most the most deadly of all um, and then just to define a laha for you that is a violent type of mud flow. Um, it's kind of a a slurry, uh, a a gloop made up of all that um, ground ash, rock, pyroclastic material uh, mixed with water. So this is this tends to happen as well when when a volcano sort of meets with a with a river. Um, yeah also quite destructive and in this case they travel pretty far I believe like y you've got how far was it it was hundreds of kilometers actually that the the furthest the furthest flows got so mm -hmm. uh, I can't find the exact rivers that they made it to um, let's see well they they reached nearly they they reached 80 kilometers to the southwest okay not hundreds let's let's say they reached the columbia river so that that forms a portion of the boundary between washington and oregon the state just south of it but hmm. the, the the point still stands it was it's pretty far 80 kilometers um pyroclastic flows of 30 meters per second hundreds of degrees centigrade uh, when a volcano like this goes off it's pretty devastating locally mm. um yeah and that's i think that's all i had to add on that particular topic <laughs> yeah well i'll just correct myself slightly it was the north the north face uh, of the mountain that collapsed uh, that i've i've been browsing the the uh, mm. photos that, and there are many on this article that really show um the quite spectacular power of nature uh, on full display um and it was the, it was the north side that collapsed um and the the volcanologist responsible for sounding the alarm was uh, a chap called uh, david a johnston who transmitted um to uh kind of, he, he was a he was a, a professional volcanologist as part of the american united states geological survey group the uh, usgs which is uh the 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 group responsible for monitoring uh, volcanic activity in the united states alongside other kind of natural phenomena um, he was in that capacity deployed to an observation post reasonably far away from the mountain like i would say uh, based on the image which i'll include in the in the in the video itself um over 40 kilometers away i think from the center of the caldera um, but just unfortunately he was uh, in the direct and his team was in the direct path of the explosion because it was the north face that collapsed and he transmitted uh, on the morning of the 18th of may the message vancouver vancouver this is it and that was the last communication reached because more or less moments later he he would have died along with everyone else um who was sort of uh, within i think the actual kind of immediate um immediate danger zone was yeah like eight miles an eight mile radius um mm. um but that was that's kind of extended uh significantly if you were on the north side because of this lateral explosion that took place um I yeah i think some... yeah <clears throat> Oh, go on, you complete your talk on him first, and I'll come back. Yeah, 
what were you saying about? Oh uh, well, I was just I just wanted to stress I think that the when you're when you're discussing these these sorts of events, the most like what I what I can't communicate enough strongly enough is the scale that you have to think at. Um, if you imagine if you imagine how far away you have to be from a mountain to photograph it properly, right? To get that that curvature, that slope where you have the skyline behind it, um, as opposed to, for example, being on the mountain where it just looks like a steep uh, hill, essentially, because you're too close to see its full profile. That sort of distance is really the the scale that you need to consider for your safety for a sufficiently strong explosion like this um anywhere mm. closer than that will probably get you killed um so yeah that's that that's what i that's what i wanted to stress um it's not a case of like oh well i'm at the foot of the mountain so you know i'm okay because it will start even if it starts uh, not at the very top laterally it's you know mm. higher up um now these things move. The pyroclastic flows move. Uh, well, the the one well, man say Helen's, for example, may have broken the sound barrier. How quickly it moved. So that's sort of sixteen uh, six hundred kilometers an hour. Um, you are not. Yeah. You are going to die if you're that close. <laughs> Please be far away. Well, I was gonna gonna add some specificity to what I was saying earlier because I realised in the table. There's a summary table at the bottom of the article that includes some stuff like the speed, the estimated speeds and temperatures um, of the pyroclastic flows um, at least 50 miles per hour. Uh -huh. um, and the pyroclastic flows covered around 16 kilometers squared. They were at least seven, well, not at least, around about 700 degrees centigrade. Um, and as you mentioned, the, the annihilation within this zone, um, yes, 60, 60 people died. We managed to get a lot of, uh, people I would expect away from, from immediate harm. Um, but of course you've got around 7,000 big game animals, deer, bear, elk estimated to have perished all the other things that lived in those uh, forests, so the burrowing rodents, frogs, all of these things, uh, well, actually, some of these things s survived because they would have been below ground level at the time or below the water surface, and that could have protected them. So actually, the, the populations of some of these smaller animals that um, were under the underground level at the time were, were less affected but the the birds the small mammals the big mammals all of them would have died within that within that region uh it was an estimated 40,000 salmon were lost uh it's a pretty horrific way to die i think you can appreciate that for a fish they were forced to swim through turbine blades of hydroelectric electric generators because the um the reservoir levels were were dropped to accommodate mud flows uh, and flooding so uh, around, yeah <laughs> lots of destruction of nature by nature mm. uh, uh, that's a really good point like the, the the death toll may have been low for humans <laughs> but less so for animals uh, and for the local wildlife who of course was I, not I keep <laughs> tying myself in knots though because I said <laughs> of nature by nature. Yes, the salmon died. The salmon were um, largely from fisheries, but uh, doesn't undo the fact that they were destroyed in mm. this. And yeah, oh, then then in eco economic terms, I'll just give that that ballpark number it, it's somewhere between three and four billion dollars of today's money um was the mm. economic destruction of the the full blast which to be to be fair like did that strike you as a bit low when you were reading it i mean obviously it's a large number 
<laughs> but on the scale of US spending every year, mm. it just it just struck me as a bit low. I wonder if it was because of how kind of isolated Mount St. Helens is, like it's in a national park yeah. area and it's quite rural. No, already. I'd say that it it didn't surprise just it's it surprised me as as a well I didn't really know about the the scale of the the ash distribution uh and three to four billion is is quite a lot considering what I did know was that it's in uh in Washington and up in quite a um a more rural less densely populated area that's that's affected but the the area affected is actually colossal and that's why I think it it reaches such a significant level because it destroyed lots of uh lots of railways and lots of roads as well mm. as like as i said like the actual generators and electronics mm. and of course that's not the end of mount st helens like it did change its shape significantly it did blow up a part of the mountain but it wasn't strong enough to completely level the mountain only everything around it so mount st helens still exists today it's still monitored it's still an active volcano and it had another period of volcanic activity uh, in the noughties between 2004 and 2008 although it never resulted in a an eruption uh not you know much less on the scale of of 1980 um, so you can go and visit Mount St. Helens you can see what all the what all the fuss was about so to speak but it will look quite different now to its photos prior to the 1980 eruption yeah it changed um, the horizon that's 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 the scale we're talking about <laughs> and there's a there's a, a photo of one day before the eruption and it really is a very beautiful a beautiful looking place mm. and I expect I mean I wouldn't know if evergreens they're fast growing trees but I can't imagine that it looks quite the same as it did uh, there's trees right right up right up to round about where the um, the bulge that exploded would have been mm. absolutely yeah um, I would also like to uh, credit um, in particular uh, of we've already mentioned the the, the the scientific teams that were documenting but have you heard of uh, a, a guy called Robert Landsberg I'm not sure if he's mentioned in the article he, um, he's mentioned yeah in the final paragraph of the introduction yeah mm, yeah um, so Robert Landsberg was a photographer who was present on the mountain slope on the day of the eruption. He brought, he wasn't there as a tourist or anything. There had been a mandatory evacuation uh, in place for about a month before this. Um, he was there in a professional capacity documenting the changes in volcanic activity and realised that he was eminently going to die um, when he lost the dice roll and was, was present when the explosion started. So in his final moments, he took photos of the eruption uh, uh, you know close up shots that it were suicidal if they had been voluntary um, and then put the camera in his backpack put his backpack on the ground and then lay down on top of the backpack um, in the hopes that his body would protect the images that he took and he died from the explosion uh, I think anyone on the slope who was that close uh, died more or less instantaneously from heat shock, painlessly. It wasn't a, it wasn't a slow or or tortuous death. Luckily, um, if you're that close, it's like being close to an atomic bomb. Like you're just sort of vaporized. There's 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 no time to really register what's happening. But uh, he was correct in that his body was sufficient, and the backpack and the camera itself to. Uh, protect the film inside and although it took the better part of three weeks for his body to be recovered eventually the film was developed and the photos are available online they were published in newspapers at the time um, and they don't show with any level of quality or granularity 
anything sort of immediately recognizable. It looks like a, it does look like an explosion, but a, a kind of a vague, muddy one. But I think as soon as you appreciate what the photos are, they become a lot more meaningful, even artistic, really. Um, and uh, I think I'll include one on the banner because it's uh, it's it's a one of a kind photograph. Because these days, of course, we can actually capture those style of photograph, but we can do it using things like drones. Uh, people yeah. sacrifice their drones all the time to get one, like you know, suicidal shots. Um, but back in 1980, this was really the only way it could have been achieved. And uh, I, I respect the commitment right until the very end. I just thought it's an incredibly human um, moment, isn't it? That he knew he was going to die, but he continued to do exactly what he was doing because he thought, presumably he thought that something could be done there could be some some legacy to this um and that's what he made out of his own death something to help the future humanity and uh supposedly it did because the the page about him says that the film um when developed provided geologists with quite valuable documentation as you said you can't really get that perspective from anywhere else yeah i agree completely it takes a lot of bravery to be able to do that uh it would be i think much more natural to kind of flee even if you knew it was pointless to just try anything um or to just panic and shut down uh, but to actually mm. maintain your professionalism as it were right until the end when you're under no obligation whatsoever to do so um is commendable um, the, the final thing, uh, well, final person I'd like to mention before we conclude is this chap, Harry R. Truman, um, who was just a local guy who refused to be evacuated. Uh, he lived in a cabin on the slopes of the mountain. Of course, come eruption day, he died. Again, probably more or less instantaneously vaporized rather than, um, uh, rather than sort of slowly or horribly. Um, his body was never found. Um, and he became something of a local hero, a bit of a bit of a legend, um, as this kind of quintessential American. I've spent my life here. I will die here on my own terms, kind of figure. Although mm. his death is maybe less stoic than the professionals on the mountain at the time, because uh, it's said that Harry Truman had a mine shaft prepared that he believed would allow him to survive an eruption if it did occur but due to the speed location and the fact that it was again a lateral eruption which is much more destructive as opposed to a vertical eruption uh he never had the chance to reach the mine shaft and even if he did he would probably have died anyway so perhaps not as in not mm. intentionally um he wasn't him yeah <clears throat> and his 16 cats and his 16 cats, yes. I cannot forget to mention the 16 cats. That was probably um, the, the only thing I remembered in advance to reading this article from my time in school. <laughs> that Harry Truman and his 16 cats. That I remembered that someone had 16 cats and that they all died. Mm. But well, That was him. Uh, uh, again, I mean, <laughs> thankfully, if you can say anything about the quality of a death he would also likely have been uh, killed very quickly and his 16 cats yes well I think we are more or less out of time but uh, I hope this has been an engaging and informative episode of that encyclopedia podcast and um, thank you very much for listening